Meet the fringe limb tree frog from the cloud forests of Panama, a remarkable little creature that evolved special webbing between its fingers and toes so it could glide from tree to tree across the misty forest canopy. Like all organisms, we can trace its lineage back to the last universal common ancestor, a microbe we call Luca that existed about 3.8 billion years ago. We can work forward to Luca then to create a natural history for this species. And if we do this, we're nearly halfway through the history of life on Earth before we have multicellular organisms. And we're nearly done the story, nearly 90% through, before we have complex animals. This happens in what we call the Cambrian Explosion, a time of rapid evolution and diversification. During the Cambrian, life was on a tear. But the continents, they were drifting. And as they drifted south, snow and ice began to accumulate, plunging the Earth into an ice age and causing the first mass extinction of complex organisms. In a climate crisis, we lose 85% of species. Life rebounds, and at this point, the ancestors of frogs and the ancestors of humans split and go down their own separate evolutionary pathways. Then the Devonian period ends with another climate crisis, a combination of bad ocean chemistry and bad atmospheric chemistry snuffs out 75% of species. And those continents, they're still drifting, and they all bump into each other, forming the supercontinent of Pangaea. And then the Earth itself opens up, gigantic volcanic fissures in what is now Siberia, issuing forth vast quantities of greenhouse gases that overheat the planet and cause the worst mass extinction ever. We call it the Great Dying. Complex life on planet Earth is nearly snuffed out. And not long after the Great Dying, the first true frogs evolve. 13 million years later, dinosaurs would evolve. Now, the Earth is a dangerous place, and those volcanic fissures open up again at the end of the Triassic period, causing another round of climate-induced mass extinction, during which we lose 75% of species. In the Jurassic period, the world of the dinosaurs really begins in earnest. And by the Cretaceous period, dinosaurs are huge, and they're on every landmass in every imaginable environment. And you never see this in the paintings, but the frogs, they were there for every minute of it. <laughs> 66 million years ago, an asteroid hits the Earth and wipes out the dinosaurs and 75% of species. Instant climate change caused by searing heat, followed by months, if not years, of winter-like conditions. It was too much for most, a dinosaur apocalypse, the world's fifth mass extinction in which we lose 75% of species. And guess who leaps back? The frogs in a burst of evolution from three groups producing most of the species that we have today. Now, fast forward to within a fraction of a percent of the end of the story, and humans evolve. Civilization arises. The petroleum age begins. 300,000 years, 10,000 years, 200 years, geologically, that's all now. It's instantaneous, and we are having instantaneous effects on the planet. Now, if you view this through the lens of deep time, if you take the time to learn the language of the rocks, the rocks, they will start to talk back to you. They will whisper to you wherever you go in the world. They always whisper the same thing. They say, it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this particular way because it's all so contingent. The future is not guaranteed. I can see that in the bones of every skeleton that I dig up. They didn't want to die, but then again, they got to be. And the Earth teaches us that the Earth did not have to have us, but we got lucky. We got to be. And it teaches us that we have to work hard for the future that we want for ourselves, and more importantly, for our posterity. For without striving for this future, it will not happen. There's too much contingency. There are too many variables. 
There's too much uncertainty for it to happen on its own. And now what are we doing? We're using the atmosphere as a garbage can. In the last 800,000 years, atmospheric CO2 has never breached 300 parts per million until recently. And now this is the brick wall that we are all facing. Since 1970, wildlife populations have decreased by 69%. Humans and our livestock now constitute 96% of the biomass of mammals on Earth. Wild mammals account now for only 4%. And in terms of extinction rates, well, low estimates are we lose a species about every other day. At the high end, it's a species every 13 minutes. Now, even if the low end is right, and it's probably not, that's devastating. And when you look at larger creatures, vertebrate animals, well, the background rate of extinction over the last two million years is about nine species per century. Well, in the last 100 years, we've lost nine species. And these, and these, and these. We are propagating the world's sixth mass extinction. And we know now from geology and paleontology that the previous five extinctions were all caused by climate crises. The last one, an instant climate crisis caused by an asteroid impact. And the fringe limb tree frog? Well, this particular individual is named Tuffy. And Tuffy lived in the Atlanta Botanical Garden until the ripe old frog age of 12, when he died. Tuffy was the last of his species. A lineage that has an unbroken chain of ancestry back 3.8 billion years to our microbial forebears, a lineage that survived all five mass extinctions, including the great dying, including the asteroid strike that took out the dinosaurs, a lineage that survived everything the Earth could throw at it for eons and eons, but it could not survive us. Nor could these recently extinct creatures. Nor these. Or the Mariana fruit bat that was declared extinct just last month. Now, we are the asteroid. But we don't have to be. There's still time to act to avoid the worst of it. So what do we do? Well, we have to do the hardest thing that civilization has ever done. We must decarbonize our society, and we must make space for the natural world, and we must do it all in very little time. And maybe, maybe we each need to find our own hardest thing, our own hardest thing that we can do personally to push back on the climate crisis, to push back on the biodiversity crisis. Look, I get it. If you're struggling to make ends meet, if you're working a second job, maybe there's not a lot you can do right now, and that's okay. But small changes do add up, and you can vote, which is a powerful force. But if you are a person with time or money or resources or a network of people to get things done, then I urge you to think about, to meditate on what's the hardest thing that you can do. Find that thing and do that thing because we are out of time, and the time to act is now. Thank you.